How are you guys doing today? Right. We're honored to be with you guys. Uh, was it Easter Holy Week? Wasn't this Easter week incredible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was just incredible. Yeah. Let's give up the yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> we got to the back two Sundays on Sunday. We got together for one of the most beautiful dinners yeah. that I've ever been a part of on Monday Thursday. Woo! If you missed it, don't worry. We're going to do it again next year. We uh, declared like we were, I don't know what's going to happen on Monday, but we're going to do it, and now we're doing it forevermore. So there you go, until the Lord comes back. Anyways, we got to honor Jesus on Good Friday, our sunrise and Easter services were just amazing, uh, and then Chris Taylor and I, uh, he's our worship pastor, he's one of our elders, we were walking down memory lane uh, recently, and we started Bible study stuff uh, for Easter back in his backyard in 2018. With just 15 people. So it's pretty awesome. From that point of view, it's been a wild ride. I think we had somewhere around 240 people on Easter Sunday between our sunrise and main service. Um, we, never, we never concern ourselves heavily on numbers because it doesn't matter if two show up or 400 show up. We're going to do what God's called us to do. But it's amazing to see the work that God has been doing, it's a privilege and honor to get to do that and participate in with him. Can we just give it up for the Lord one more time? Amen. So if you're new or you're just joining us from one of our Easter services, we'd like to welcome you back. I saw some other faces, some faces that are returning. Welcome back. We love you here. And we want to let you know that we've been going through a study uh, through two letters in the Bible, uh, written from Paul to his young son of the faith, his protege, and student Timothy. And so since October, we've been going verse by verse through first and second Timothy, seeking wisdom and how as a church, we are to operate in the things of the Lord. So we've got just two more weeks, today and next Sunday, going through second Timothy chapter four, and then we'll close it out. Since we've been, uh, had a few weeks of a break since we were in second Timothy, I thought we'd do something that we haven't done yet, and we're gonna go back to the start of chapter four. We'll be in the first eight verses this morning talking about legacy. Legacy. This will be a two-part message on leaving a godly legacy and what that means. So no matter what we do in life, every single one of us is living our future legacy today. Paul gives Timothy some great insight and knowledge on how to leave a God-honoring legacy by living for him today. Before we jump in, would you pray with me one more time? God, we thank you for all that you're doing in this place. We thank you for your word that it makes us come alive. We thank you that you've declared over us life and not death. That you have declared freedom, that you have declared forgiveness. God, we don't take it lightly. We stand here as your sons and daughters, so grateful for you. We give you all the honor and praise this morning. We ask that you would speak to us from your word. Make it come alive in us uh, this morning, Lord. Just make it hit differently. That by your spirit, you would awaken us to these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-3, I'm going to read it, and then we'll go back. And this is the public declaration of Scripture. So it says this, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. But for you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Do discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So the last time we met, we were going through the first five ver verses, Verkus, that's a whole different thing, you don't even know you're about to learn today, did you? We're going through the first five verses, we focus on Paul's command to Timothy and to us regarding our duties. We have a job to do. He said in verse 1, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, 
I give you this chart. Translation, he says, remember, you will have to stand before God and give an account for what you did or didn't do in your life. That's for every single one of us. We will individually have to stand before God and give an account, a testimony of how we lived our lives and what we did for him in the end. And it was in that authority and reminder that Paul redirected Timothy and said, I give you this charge. So this short, this short passage comes, as you will remember, right after Paul reinforced him and reminding Timothy to watch out for the end time signs that are present and to stick to what he knows is true. God's word. To not falter or slide into the, the deception that was so prevalent and increasing in his time. So don't give in to the world and don't give in to the false teachings of the world. But I'd also like to remind us that it's not just Timothy that this is directed. Okay. It was Paul's intent, his heart, the direction to have these letters shared amongst the churches for the mutual edification and building up of the body as a whole. We saw in chapter 3, verse 16 of 2 Timothy, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That's all scripture is good and profitable for all people so that we may be adequately and thoroughly equipped for what? To sit and listen out on a Sunday morning. Yes. No, no, he says for every... I had someone that was like, hey, man. Hey. <laughs> that means if you're a Christian, you've been given freedom and salvation not for yourself, but for the benefit of others. For the benefit of God's kingdom. We aren't to take our freedom and just live wild and for ourselves. It says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be what? Say with me, free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in what? Love. The truth for us this morning is that to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And in that salvation, we've then been called to good works. Not to indulge the flesh, but rather serving one another in love. What does that mean? It means we have a healthy view of God and a proper view of our place standing before Him. Is salvation free? No. Absolutely, right? It was paid for by the, by the word of Jesus, so Dave says, no, yes, you're right. <laughs> Salvation is free to us, it was not free for Jesus, right? We paid for it. So then are works a prerequisite requirement to that salvation? Absolutely not, right? The, Bible's, the Bible message is clear. We've been saved so that we can serve and love others more than we serve and love ourselves. Amen. So freedom came from Jesus. And he says, now that you are free, here's what you get to do. We all individually will have to stand before God and give an account, a testimony of how we lived our lives and what we did or didn't do for him in the end. It's called a legacy. What is a legacy? Legacy means the long-lasting impact of particular events, actions, or behaviors that took place in the past in someone's life. Our life and how we live today will dictate what our legacy is in the future. We always think about legacy as something far off or way out there, right? And we'll worry about it sometime in the future, right? Like, well, I mean, isn't that just stuff they talk about when you die? Well, where do they get the stories from when you live, right? So whether you agree or not, we are living our future legacy right now. What you do today matters for tomorrow and the next day and the next month and the next year. It matters. So legacy doesn't just speak to what people will say about us when we're gone either. That's all good. But who cares? We're gone, right? Hallelujah. Like if you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus. When you're gone, praise the Lord. Like we're not, we're not. We're, listen, it's going to be good, okay? There's no more tears. This land of no more, right? No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. Like we are free and we are with Jesus face to face. So who cares what people will say to us when we're gone? The bigger picture I want us to grasp this morning is the legacy that will be looked back on by God when we go to him face to face. You think your legacy will stay down here on earth? 
No, 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 my friends. The real impact of your legacy won't be felt on earth, but in eternity for you. What are you living for today? Today dictates that future legacy. It's not a do whatever you want today and then slide in under the banner of Christ in the end. It's living and serving Him today that will dictate what kind of legacy you have to present to Him on that day. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the famous Welsh Protestant minister of Westminster uh, Chapel in London, he once said this, he said, There is nothing which is more insulting to the holy name of God than to profess Him with your lips and yet deny Him in your life. That's so good. Like, you guys don't write like that anymore. You'd be like, they didn't even know it was a tweetable quote back then. I'm just like, no, it's the Lord gave me this stuff. This is not the truth right here. I'm going to read it one more time. He says, There is nothing which is more insulting to the holy name of God than to profess Him with your lips and yet deny Him in your life. As we see in the, this closeout of 2 Timothy and our two part message on legacy, that Paul lays out clearly how to leave a godly legacy. He shows us his legacy, and then he shows us next week the legacy of those who didn't finish well. For us this morning, let's look at Paul's instructions on how to leave a godly legacy by how we live today. This is how to leave a godly legacy. Number one, preach the word. Preach the word. He says this in verse 1 of 2 Timothy 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, that time is coming, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this, what, charge, command. I, I, I lay this against you, Timothy, church. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season for what? To give a reason for the hope that is in you, the Bible says. He says, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. This right here is a clarity of the mission for us as a church in 2022. It's clarity. You want to clarity? What am I supposed to be doing? What does my life mean? I don't know what my purpose is. This is it right here. The mission of the church. If you are a believer of Jesus, you are the church. Amen. You are the church. Right. It's not the building. It's you. Yes. And so this is the clarity for you as the church. It says that we love him. Jesus laid this out for us. He said, love him. Love others. They share the gospel. And we make disciples. It's each and every one of our jobs to be able to teach and share the gospel or the word of God with others. Now, I know that we've said this a lot, and we've stayed on this course since we started the church. It's not, a, it's not an accident. No. It's strategic. It's what we're supposed to be about here on earth. It's not what we have to do. It's what we get to do. It's not what we do. It's who we are. We're not called to take ourselves out of this world, to separate ourselves from the world. That's not what Jesus prayed to the Father, is it? He says, I pray that you don't take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. We're supposed to occupy the world until Jesus comes again. I want you to go out into the world, the Great Commission. Go out. Occupy, fill those dark places and those dark voids. Oh, I hate Vegas, you know, you love Vegas. Uh, Sam City, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And I don't know how Christians can live in Vegas. You better go to Vegas. Shine the light of Jesus in Vegas, right? People say, I mean, I, I've said this, I don't like going to LA. I need mean, to repent because I don't want the Lord to send me to LA. <laughs> <laughs> bring the light of the gospel and the love of Jesus into those situations. You know, we think, oh man, I, I can't hang out at like, we go to a restaurant it's called Jay Riley, it's down in Redlands, and I love being there. People are like, well, you go there? Yeah, I go there. It's a bar. It is a bar. And you know what we do every single time we go there? We talk to people about Jesus. It's yeah. awesome. Right? He's saying, don't divorce yourself from the things of the world. Now, if this becomes an issue, right? He says, well, then you need to take some stock and you need to take a turn in your life. But that's not, he's not calling us out of the world, he's calling us into the world so that we can bring the light of the gospel into these places. It's why it's so important to be here in California. I was talking about this just this morning with a couple of us. Listen, if all the 
Bible-believing, Christ-following Christians left this state, what state would our state be in? Right? Think about it. And I know that it's like, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. Listen, we've had something like 35 close personal families leave the state of California. Personal family, my whole entire family is gone, right? I have a couple families that are still here. But everybody else left. If all of the Bible-believing, Christ-following Christians left this state, what state would our state be in? Not good. We have to occupy and strategically place ourselves in places where we can share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. We don't scream at people. We don't bash people with it. We don't tell people how ugly their sins are. That kind of preaching does nothing for those whose eyes haven't been open to the truth. It does nothing to them. They're like, yeah, look at these mean, vindictive, angry. As a Christian, it's, Christians are so angry all the time. Like, why do I tell them this stuff? Like, that's terrible. I, when I read the scripture, you come to services like Monday Thursday, was that the heart of Jesus? Man, no, that was the heart of Jesus, right? Like, he loved, he laughed, he spent time with people. The Bible says the message of the cross is, what, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us being saved, it is the very power of God. It's a harsh and ugly, self-righteous, Bible-bashing does nothing to those who are unenlightened in the truth. You know, it opens eyes to receive the truth about Jesus. What is the trait that leads people to repentance? A harsh word or a loving kindness? Romans 2.4. He says, or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience? Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. Aren't we called to imitate Christ? We are. The word kindness here is Christos. What does that sound like? Isn't that interesting? Which is to be kind, good, and benevolent to someone. Isn't kindness, Christos, the very heart of Christ? It is. So Paul tells us how to leave a godly legacy is by sharing his word with loving kindness. Sharing the truth in love. Now I know that this is terrifying for some people. Like you might be sitting here thinking, no way, Pastor Mike. No way. Speaking in public is actually literally, speaking in public or talking in front of strangers is literally feared more than death. People would rather die than speak in public. Like, this is a real, look it up. You don't believe people are like, that's funny, Mike. Yeah, look it up. It's real. Like, still to this day, people would rather die than speak in public or talk to strangers. And some of you in the room are going, yeah, that's me. Amen. Amen. Paul is not saying, in order to leave a godly legacy, you have to stand in a pulpit and preach to strangers. It's not what he's saying. That's not the full context of sharing the gospel. Some of us can, right? I know that God has called me to. I'll tell you this, I, it still terrifies me to this day. It still terrifies me to stand in front of people. I don't care if it's 20 people. I don't care if it's 200 people. I've spoken to crowds as big as 1,500 people. It terrifies me all the same. But it's cool, right? If that's what he's called you to, you can do it. That's cool. Go ahead and do it, right? But if you're here and the thought of preaching or sharing the gospel with strangers terrifies you, chances are God hasn't called you to that, or at least called you to that yet, right? Sharing the gospel isn't being a Billy Graham or a Jonathan Edwards, right? It's not being oh, like great glory. I gotta be a great glory. I gotta do a, you know a harvest crusade, right? Like he's in Idaho right now. I just look. Like, can we pray for them right now? Let's just pray for the harvest crusade right now. Lord Jesus, God, I just thank you so much for our brother, Pastor Gray, Lord, and how he is such an incredible evangelist, Lord, and how he has these uh, things that he's doing right now, the crusades. God, we pray that your word would go out so powerfully that you would bring many, many, many into the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Sharing the gospel isn't Billy Graham or Jonathan Edwards. Sharing the gospel can look like you telling your kids the great news about how Jesus saved them. Amen. Sharing the gospel is you sharing Jesus with your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews, your spouse, your, your, uh, your family members, right? Living the gospel out by being in the world but not participating in the things of the world gives us an opportunity to share the hope that we have. Or how about this? How about 
leveraging your friend circles to start bringing the conversations off of gossip and onto the hope and healing that we have in Christ. You see, leaving a godly legacy of preaching the word doesn't mean you have to have some high and lofty position to do it. Some of the greatest teachers of God's word have never preached a sermon in their life. They lived it out and showed others who Jesus is by reflecting him in their lives. Sharing with their friends and family, that is something that we can all do. The truth is, God wouldn't call us to this unless he was willing to see us through this. He only calls us to things that he's willing to see us through. If he calls you to it, he will see you through it, right? Sharing the good news is one of the highest callings in a Christian life that we can fulfill. Sharing the gospel. It's one of the highest callings. That's a godly legacy. How else can we live today so as to leave a godly legacy? By number two, not being swayed by the things of this world. Be in the world, but don't be swayed by the things of the world, right? It says this in 2 Timothy 4, 3. For the time will come when people will not, will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around themselves a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. We covered these in detail a few weeks ago, but again, I want to point these out because next week we're going to see the people who were swayed by the world and left Paul and the faith because of their love for the things of the world over their love for Jesus. It's a great reminder and caution for us today. Paul said, for there will come a time. What time? Paul was just talking about the last days in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and so it would be easy to assume he's still going on about the same time frame. He said, in those days, in the last days, people will not put up with sound doctrine or teachings. The problem that we see today is that people don't want to be offended for anything, do they? We don't want to be offended for what they do or believe. They instead want to be applauded for it. They want to be applauded for what they do or they think. We have to be aware of these things and not allow ourselves to be swayed by them. The gospel of Jesus is good news. He brings us to repentance through his loving kindness. But just because he is loving and he is kind, it doesn't mean that his word won't offend us, won't offend our thinking, won't offend what we do in our lives. To be honest, sometimes we need to be offended so that we can take a good look into our hearts at those areas of offense and ask God, why is this offending me so much? Offense isn't always bad. It highlights areas in which we need to come back under his rule and reign. You see, sometimes you get into the, you get into the word and it offends you. Well, I, I've been doing this for years this way. And he's like, yeah, but it's not the right way, right? There are people today who don't want to put up with sound doctrine of the scriptures because they instead just want to be told what they're doing is okay, and then no matter what, they will be okay at the end. You don't need to repent or change your ways. God will love you anyways. We don't like being told that what we think or how we behave is wrong. So people, it says, will gather around themselves a great number of teachers, philosophers, and so-called pastors to say what their itching ears want to hear. I don't want you to say anything that's going to make me change anything in my life. Just tell me something that makes me feel good, right? They turn their ways away, the ears away from the truth, and turn aside to these myths, and it leads them astray. That's the fault of the wicked. Don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. Tell me how I can keep doing what I'm doing, and I can feel good about it. You tell me that. That's wicked. And there is a way, the Bible says, that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's death. Proverbs 14, 12 says that. You want to have a good and godly legacy in the future? Live for him today. And don't let yourself be swayed like the rest of the world who is lost to their own devices. Don't give in to the wickedness of our culture by finding anything that will justify your thinking. Instead, go to the scripture and say, how do I need to come back in alignment in my life to the word of God? Let the Spirit of God, through His Word, offend those areas of your life that aren't in alignment and come back to Him for healing and forgiveness. Because He makes paths straight, doesn't He? Because you cannot faithfully serve the gospel if you do not first savor the gospel. 
You can't serve the gospel, which is to preach the gospel, share the word of the gospel, unless you personally first savor it for yourself. If it offends, let it offend. If it stings or cuts, that's its job. Think about this. It's not called the butter knife of the spirit, right? <laughs> it's not. It's not called the, the, the jam spreader of the spirit. It's called the what? The sword of the spirit. We have to let we have to learn it. We have to savor it and not depart from it like someone in the habit of doing. And if that sword cuts, let it cut. Let it cut out those things. God prunes those things out of our life for a reason because it's not good. Right? And then number three, the third point Paul makes is him being to us on how to leave a godly legacy is by fulfilling your ministry. He says, fulfill your ministry. Verse five. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and discharge all the duties of what? Your ministry. But for you, you and you and you and you and you and you and me, but as for us, we need to be sober in all things. We need to be willing to endure hardships, to be ready to do the work of an evangelist. We, and we need to make sure that we're discharging all the duties of our ministries. Be sober-minded. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist, which, again, is sharing the gospel, and fulfill your ministry. There is a great work that God has set for you to do. And I know that you think, well, that's not what we do here in America. That's not what we do here at the church, right? Like, it's not, it's not me. Like, we come to church, and then we let the staff of the church do the work of ministry. Amen. Hallelujah. I just get, I'm going to come and receive from Jesus, right? I think we've got a bunch of fat cows just sitting on couches, more and more and more, just more and more and more, more for me, more for me, and they're never willing to do it. There's this great work that God has set for you to do. I believe that to each person who called on Jesus as their Lord and Savior, to each and every single believer, we've all been given a ministry to fulfill here on earth. Every single believer is a minister and has been given a ministry to live out. If we're all a part of the body, that means that we are all each a vital part, and we each have something vital to do in order to accomplish the will of God and bring his kingdom here. When I stand before my creators on the day of my death, or on the day that he takes us out of here, I want to hear those angel words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Think about that. Yes. That's it. I don't want a special seat. I don't want some special assignment. I just want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And I just want to serve Jesus for the rest of eternity. You want me to clean the golden toilets, Lord? I'll do it forevermore, Lord. Done. Right? I want the legacy of my life to be one of service to my king. You know what I'm saying? That should be the goal of every believer. I want the legacy of my life to be one of service to my king. If that means I discharge the duties as a godly pastor, let it be done. If that means you discharge your duties as a godly mother, let it be done. It means you discharge the duties as a godly teacher, let it be done. If that means you discharge your duties of your ministry as a godly retail worker, let it be done. A godly bank teller, police officer, health technician, whoever God has called you to be, and whatever God has called you to do, discharge all the duties of that ministry with Christ at the forefront. That's a legacy that we can get behind, amen? Amen. That's leaving God in place. You see, the front lines of the spiritual fight for the gospel going out into all the world has shifted in the American church for us. You see, places like Africa, Asia, they've been doing this for decades. Not for us. It's no longer just church on Sundays. It's God calling us back to the neighborhoods we live in, to the places we work at, to the activities we're involved in, and to make an impact in those places for Him. It's the people of God being the church outside of these four walls. There's a divide between what we do in our faith most of the times. The divide between your faith 
in your work, your faith in your family, your faith in your hobbies isn't supposed to exist. It's who we are in Him. It's who we are all the time. In every situation He calls us to, that's the real deal, godly legacy that we want to live in today. That's what Paul's life was and who we need to be also. So let's look quickly at the second half of this coin, the last three verses here. Paul shifts from a charge or command to Timothy and to us to now here's my legacy. It's shifting from here's how to live to now here's the end goal. Here's the end. This is a godly legacy fulfilled. This is Paul's legacy. So Paul, as you know, has come to the end of his life. This letter of 2 Timothy is believed to be one of or the very last letter that he ever wrote. This is it for Paul. His time has come to close on this side of eternity. He's about to be beheaded for his faith in Jesus. He knows it. And he's done. And there's nothing else I can do. I know. I'm going to leave this jail cell. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get my head chopped off. <laughs> it's, it's similar to a terminal diagnosis of some kind. It's where we're given a very clear end date or, date or end date of our life. And we know that that's the date or days that we have left. For most of us, we have no idea when that day will be. We're told to live with the understanding that none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And that's why living for Jesus today is so important. The Bible says your life is but a mist. Here one second and gone the next. Because we're not sure when we'll have to give an account for our life and our legacy to the Lord. And the, the, the time that we will uh, be held accountable to him for what we did or how we lived. Today is the day of salvation. It's not too late. You might be sitting here thinking like, man, well, Pastor Mike, you know, I've lived 45 years of my life and I've not lived for the Lord. Did you know that he's in the redemption business? Yeah, Did you know that all of those stories that you have of your past life are now stories of God's grace and mercy to you? Did you know that that is God's testimony? Yes. That is God's testimony to other unbelievers? Mm -hmm. And that when you stand, if you turn from your wicked ways and you turn to Christ, you operate in the new man that he's created you to be? Did you know that as you stand before him, he looks at you and says, well done, good and faithful? It doesn't matter if you've served him all your life or you're sitting here today and you're like, I, I'm not even, I don't even believe in it yet. Like, I have to accept him as Lord and Savior. Today can be a changing point for your life. And you can start living today for the Lord. We need to turn from the ways of our old man and then turn to Jesus to give us direction as the new man that he's called us to be. For Paul, he knew his time was up and reflecting on his life, he came to these conclusions. What's interesting is the three things he proclaims are all in direct correlation to the commands that he gave Timothy. I'm going to show it to you. He said this in verse 6. He says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, for the time of my departure is near. He knew it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. He knew death was imminent, and looking back, he could say with confidence three things. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race God has marked out for me. And I have kept the faith in him. These statements and declarations are tied directly to the previous commands given to Timothy. Paul's argument runs like this. But as for you, Timothy, he says it's time for you to fulfill your ministry. For I am at the point of death. It's all the more vital for you to continue and complete your ministry because my life work has reached completion and is about to come to a close. As Joshua had followed Moses, and, and Solomon, David, and Elijah, Elijah, so now Timothy must follow Paul, and we must follow all those who have come before us. Don't try to give it to someone else. It's for you. God has placed you here for a purpose. We need your gift in order to accomplish everything that God is calling us to as a church. You have a sphere of influence that only you can affect change in. That's why God has given it to you. Paul knew this succession, and so he gives Timothy the threefold declaration of his life. It's awesome. He said, number one, I fought the good fight. How did he fight the good fight? By preaching the word. Let me connect these dots for you. 2 Timothy 4, 2, he tells Timothy, you want to leave a godly legacy? Here it is. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct. Rebuke and courage with great patience and careful instruction. Right? Yeah. Then he says, I have fought this good fight. Mm -hmm. He says, I have fought that fight. Mm -hmm. It's a good fight. 
He tells Timothy, preach the word. Then Paul was saying, I've done it. Be ready in season and out of season to give an answer with the hope inside of you. I've done it. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instructions. I've done it. You see, Paul wasn't telling us something that he himself hadn't done. He tells us to do these things because he knows that we can. If a murderous blasphemer like Paul, when he was Saul, can do these things, so can you, and so can I. It's not so much him boasting in himself as it is to say, I can, and so can you. Then he says, number two, I've finished my race. How? Think about the imagery of putting our lives in line of a great race. How do you finish a race? By not giving up and by not being swayed off course, right? Like you finish the race by being on course and you run until the end. It's not by being distracted by what's going on to the left and the right, but by what? Running hard to the finish line. Again, how did Paul accomplish this? Verse 3, he says, For the time will come when people will not put up a sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around themselves a great number of teachers to say what their engineers want to hear. Lots of distractions and hardships along the way in this race, y'all. Lots of thoughts and teachings that would be in contradiction to the truth found only in Christ. Paul was saying, don't be swayed. You think he was confronted by false and terrible things in his life? He was. But he says this, I have finished the race. Isn't that incredible? Was it hard? Absolutely. Ask any runner. Did you ever want to give up? Runners, they say all the time. All the time, but yet Paul pressed on. He refused to allow the hardships, the persecutions, the jail time, being stoned, literally, right? That's crazy. They thought he was dead. They would stone Paul to death. He's just laying there, uh, knocked out. They have to leave him for dead. He gets back up and goes back into the city. <laughs> he endured. Imagine having that kind of perspective. Yes, people are hurling stuff at me, but yet I press on towards the finish line. I'm not distracted by these things. I'm not going to let them get, throw me off course. I'm going to continue on. Imagine having that kind of perspective. Paul said, I did it. You can too. And then the third thing he says is, I've kept the faith. How? How could Paul, how can we keep the faith in such crazy and uncertain times? It's by chasing after Jesus and fulfilling our ministries. 2 Timothy 4, 5, it says, But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure the hardship. It's hard, but endure. Do the work of an evangelist. Share the word. And discharge all the duties of your ministry. He says, I have kept this faith. We keep the faith by staying, staying so connected to Jesus, our vine, that these good works come flowing out naturally. It's by imitating Paul as he imitated Christ. We keep the faith by being sober-minded in all situations. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We stay frosty, right? Military, law enforcement, they know what it means, right? Stay frosty and aware of the moving of God, follow his leading, being sensitive to his promptings and saying yes to him. We keep the faith by enduring the hardships of life. When the going gets tough, the tough what? Get it going, right? How many of you guys have heard that before? Okay, just the older people in the room. That's all. <laughs> just kidding. Some young kids. It's awesome. Anyways, recognize that it's not ease in this life, but through fires and trials that He purifies us. I was talking to somebody about that this morning, too. It's by trials of fire that He purifies us. He wants to purify your life. You see, we come to Him and He starts to redeem. Have you ever seen purification, or uh, have you ever seen the crucible melting down metal and purifying gold, right? You know that process is brutal. You have to melt it and burn it down to nothing. Then you burn the top with this, like, flame, and you scrape it, and then you dunk it, and you do it again and again until it becomes pure. And that's what God is doing to us, the crucible. To be in the crucible, God's crucible of fire is for our benefit. We keep the faith by enduring Paul wasn't boasting. He was saying, this is what you should be doing, and here's the proof that you can. If the legacy of, of our life is built on things of this world, I'm telling you right now, it won't hold up against the weight when we stand before Jesus. There's an old hymn by C.T. Studd. He said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. 
Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. A true, godly, and lasting legacy is one built and accomplished by living for Jesus. By living today, we are building a legacy of tomorrow, one way or another. It's either good or it's bad. I love this. In Matthew 24, we're going to be getting close. In Matthew 24, uh, verse 13, it says Jesus, talking about the end times, he gives this kind of weird declaration in the middle of all the things happening in the end times. He says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. It's not a picture of some huge vision and massive ministries and big moves and crazy things that we need to do. It's simple. The one who stands firm in Jesus until the end will be saved. Remain faithful to Jesus. To fulfill your ministry, it doesn't mean you have to start a 501c3 and become a nonprofit and brand it and advertise it and blow it up on social media and register it with the state. It just means being faithful to Jesus all the way to the end. Leave a godly legacy by being, a, by being faithful to Jesus as you talk and pray with your kids at night. Leave a godly legacy by being faithful to Jesus as you work with honesty and integrity at your place of business. Fulfill your ministry and leave a godly legacy by being faithful to Jesus as you see an opportunity to extend a hand to someone in need and you take it. Fulfill your ministry and leave a godly legacy by being faithful to Jesus as you confess and repent and show others that it's okay to be real and honest with him because he cares for us. There's an incredible promise to us if we do this. What's the promise? Verse 8. 2 Timothy 4. Paul says, Now there is in store for me, this is the future hope, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Why should we care about legacy? Because in the end, we don't just finish. We win a prize. How many of you love winning prizes? I love winning prizes. A crown of righteousness is in store. It's given to all those who have fought the good fight by sharing his word. Who have finished the race by not being swayed or thrown off course. And it's given to those who have kept the faith by fulfilling their ministries. In the end, we will stand before the righteous judge, King Jesus. Every single one of us will give an account for how we lived our lives. How we use the time that he's given us. What are we going to stand before? What are we going to stand before? This is God's righteousness. It's his righteousness. Think about that. Bestowed upon us. It's not anything that we've deserved. We don't fulfill our ministries in order to earn the righteousness. It's not ours. Philippians 3.8. It says, what is more, I consider everything a loss. This is Paul speaking. Everything that I've accomplished in my life and being a Jew among Jews. Knowing, Jesus, knowing the word better than anybody else and serving him faithfully. He says, what is more, I consider all of that a loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. Scubula. I'm not going to say the word, but look it up. It's a bad word. Also a bad word. But so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It's God's righteousness and goodness in our life this morning. I'll close with this as the band comes back up. We need to choose today who we're going to serve. Because it's either God or it's this world. I know that we think, well, that's a little harsh. That's a little black and white. That's a, that's a firm line. I didn't draw the line. Jesus did. He says, if you have one foot in the world, he says, I will literally spit you out. I will vomit you out of my mouth if you are lukewarm. You're neither hot for me nor you're cold for me. He says, if you are lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's disgusting to the Lord. 
And so we're either living for him or we're not. Our goal isn't to amass some kind of great wealth or possessions or titles. We can't take any of that stuff with us, can we? You know what will follow us into eternity? What we did for Jesus. Let me ask you this. Are you longing for Christ? Are you longing for him today? Or are you just longing for a relief from your financial burdens? <clears throat> are you longing for Christ or just an experience with his spirit? The prize Paul speaks of is for all who long for Jesus. Are we longing for him and him alone today? Would you pray with me as we close? Lord Jesus, guys, thank you. That not on the basis of our doing, but on the basis of your, your sacrifice on the cross, we stand before you free, redeemed, forgiven. Lord, what an incredible thought to be able to live for you, to be able to be close to you in this life and the next, and you still give us the crown of righteousness. Father, I feel unworthy to even be in your presence. And yet you call me a son. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we feel that in our lives we've, we've, not, we've, not, we've not hit the mark. We don't make it. I've messed up. I've had these things in my life that, that I, I feel like I've carried for so long. And yet your word is there. And tell us that you will take our burdens. You will give us a new life. Father, we thank you. We glorify you for your righteousness imputed to us this morning. I want to talk to you guys that are in the room right now. Maybe some of you are here and you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you're here and you've never, or maybe you're here and you know that you're far from him. Not just that you haven't given your life, but you've noticed that your life has swayed from him. And you want to come back to him today. There's an incredible promise in scripture. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He will save anyone who believes in him. And all it takes is you coming back to the foot of the cross and say, God, here I am, forgive me. And guess what he does? He forgives you. Those things what you think that are hidden in the dark, he sees them. He knows about them. And he says, let me in there. I want to I want to help clean up. No, 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 Lord, I don't want you to see it. I need to clean it up. He says, no, that's no, not your job. It's fine. I've already done it. Would you let me? If that's you, I want to encourage you today to get some prayer. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. You come back to him in repentance, and times of refreshing will come from the Lord, the Bible says. So if that's you, we're not going to do anything to embarrass you. This is between you and the Lord. We have an incredible prayer team in the back. And if you need prayer in these next few songs, we'd encourage you to go back there and get prayed for. Tell them what you need. I just need to be prayed over. I need to be forgiven. I have a strong goal that needs to be broken, and I'll do that for you. So Father, we thank you for all that you're doing. We know that you are strong. You are mighty to save. And so we come to you with bowed knees and bended heads, Lord. We glorify you. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you that the legacy is not something that we have done, but what you have done. And the declaration of our life is not look at me, but look at you. King, Jesus. I think you be with us now in Jesus' holy name. Amen.